and kingdoms will bow down Every chain will break His broken hearts declare His praise But who can stop the Lord Almighty Cause our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him cause our God is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save, is here to set the captives free for who can stop the lord almighty because our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him because our god is the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Cause our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Cause our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Cause our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Cause our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him.
Father God, we thank you for gathering us here tonight. We thank you for the privilege of your presence here in the Eucharist. And we thank you, Father, for this invitation to worship, to worship with abandon, to give you what you deserve, whether we feel like it or not. Because, Father, I, I confess I'm, I'm very often tired. I'm very often distracted. I'm very often frustrated with my own inadequacies or perceived inadequacies of others. But Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to come and worship, to give you your due. So Father, whatever it is that's distracting us right now, whether it's uh, what we have to do later tonight, what we have to do later this week, uh, the cares and concerns, Father, we just, we, we take those and we lay them down at the foot of the cross and we ask that you would fill us instead with a spirit of worship, a spirit of right praise, that you'd fill us with that, that filial spirit that cries out, Abba, Father, and we ask that you would teach us to pray. Teach us, come Holy Spirit, teach us to love and be loved and teach us to lift up the worship that is his due. It is an act of justice. So we give ourselves here, Lord, receiving all you have to give. Give it all to you, I lay it 
is my heart, you can have it. All my hurt, you can take it. Here's my shame, you erase it. You exchange my chains for freedom. Here's my heart, you can have it. All my hurt, you can take it. Here's my shame, you erase it. You exchange my chains for freedom. Here's my heart, you can have it. All my hurt, you can take it. Here's my shame, you erase it. You exchange my chains for freedom. Here's my heart, you can have it. All my hurt, you can take it. Here's my shame, you erase it. You exchange my chains for freedom. Here's my heart, you can have it. All my hurt, you can take it. Here's my shame, you erase it. You exchange my chains for freedom. Here's my heart, you can have it. All my hurt, you can take it. Here's my shame, you erase it. You exchange my chains for freedom. My chains for freedom. I lay it down, surrender to you now, holding nothing back. You can have it. We give it all to you, I lay it down, surrender to you now, holding nothing back, you can have it all, I lay it down, with arms open wide, nothing left behind, we give it to you I lay it down 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 I lay Here's my heart, you can have it All my hurt, you can take it Here's my shame, you erase it You exchange my chains for Father, we thank you for bringing us tonight into your presence. We thank you for being here with us, tabernacled with us in the Eucharist, and tabernacled with us in the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would anoint everything about this night. We ask for a renewal of our minds and a transformation of our hearts. We pray over everyone who will be speaking, teaching, sharing, witnessing. All of us as students, Lord, that you would open our hearts to the truth of who we are and whose we are. Renew our minds that we could see as you see. We ask that everything we do tonight would be for your glory and that whatever is not of you would just fall away. We bring you our anxieties, our worries, our concerns, our families, our spouses, our children, our workplaces, 
our ministries, our outreaches, all of our relationships, Lord. We need more of you. We just place them here at the foot of the cross and we make an offering of our time to you tonight. As we pray, all glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone, welcome. So good to see you all. Going to spin this around. I'm Dot. I know you all, I think. But if I don't, please let me know afterwards. Nick and the year two students, so if you are a returning student, you did this whole encounter thing last year, you guys are going to dismiss back across the street to the year two classroom, as we will call it. If you are not a returning student and you're here for the first time tonight or you're beginning year one with us, Awesome, welcome, we're so glad you're here. There are sort of two levels right now. Those of you who have applied online and you, you know you applied, you got an email, you may have already gotten your dashboard login, please make sure you picked up a folder that looks like this on the table in the back. We made folders for you and it's got your hands, handouts in it. If you haven't applied, if you are here and you're kind of testing out the waters or you just haven't taken the time yet to fill out the application, that's awesome. We still want to make sure you get a handout tonight, but we're not going to necessarily give you all of the over... I'm going to just rewind on this. Let's just say everyone grab a folder. Go ahead and grab one because I do want you to have it to write on. And if you, at the end of the night, are like, nope, this is just not for me, we encourage you to come back next week anyway. So grab a folder. Oh, we have a couple more. I have a box of them. I just don't lay them all out on the table. Awesome. There's more in that box right there. Can you grab them? Awesome. Thanks. There you go. A couple things is you open up your folder. Before you open your folder, I might you just look at the cover real quick. The come and see nights are tonight, next Monday, and the next Monday. And we, we shared this last Sunday at the orientation, but I really would encourage you to come and see all three nights. They're interesting teachings. I think they're interesting teachings. They're uh, going to be different teachers. Tonight you'll hear from Father Michael. Next week you'll hear from Deacon Theobald. Uh, the next night we have other student teachers. And so I would encourage you, go ahead and come and prayerfully discern, are these teachings and is this weekly meeting, is this community and this fellowship, this time of worship, is it blessing my spiritual life? Is it blessing my family life? Is it helping me be a better disciple, a better son or daughter of the Father? Is it enriching my life? Um, I know it's a big commitment. When I first heard about Encounter, a friend of ours down in Tampa Bay 
invited us to do Encounter School Online, and I had just had Gianna, she was little, and I was like, I had just graduated actually with my master's from Franciscan, and my first thought was a little bit prideful, but I was like, what could they teach me that I don't already know from a master's in theology? And I said no, and then I got invited again, and I got invited to the Encounter Conference, and I was like, I'm not going to Michigan in the winter. Like, that's just bad theology. No, it's not theology. But I, was, I had no desire to kind of, I was just at a spot with kids and life, and I was like, I'm tired. You know, I feel overextended in a lot of areas, and I just finished a big push to get my master's thesis done. I just need some time to not do anything. And I took that time to not do anything. And as far as my personal life and spiritual growth went, not much happened. I just sort of plateaued, got a little lazy, no longer had to rise to the challenge. Found that I was even, you know, week after week coming to the confessional, and not here, that, not that confessional because we didn't live here, bringing the same sins every week and being like, yeah, I'm just kind of in a rut, you know? I wonder if this is ever going to change. I wonder if I've just maxed out on holiness. Like, not that I was even that holy, but I just couldn't figure out, like, I, I wanted to be a saint. Like, I wanted to be a saint since I was a little kid, and I was raised with them as heroes, and I went to Florida State University and the Catholic Student Union, and I met Pope John Paul II. Like, I wanted to, I wanted to be all out, sold out for the gospel, but I had done the, like, the marriage thing and the mom thing and the kid thing, and we were doing ministry, and we were doing young adult ministry, and it just felt like everything was on autopilot, and I wondered, like, is this, like, it? Or is there another, like, am I missing something? Because I was, I was coming to daily Mass especially. I was hungry for holiness. I wanted to transform the world. I wanted my family to be holy. I wanted my kids to be raised in the faith. But it always felt like I was kind of running just above empty. And I didn't have any relationship at that point in my life really with the Holy Spirit. If I'm honest, I would say I grew up very strong in a relationship with God the Father. I saw God the Father as a good father. I had a pretty good dad. He had some issues, don't we all? And I came to know that like God loves me. He created me for love. He's good. He has a plan for me. And then my dad went through some really hard stuff, and I also started to question my faith because I was going off to college. I did some church hopping, wondering if, you know, Catholicism was really the best because we don't serve coffee on Sundays. And I landed in a relationship with Jesus. I was like, y'all, Eucharist, do you know? He's here. Somehow I had gone through Catholic school my whole life, and no one mentioned that he was like, here, here, like here, here, in the Eucharist. And so I had this reconversion, or this real conversion, I would say, in college, through a Eucharistic encounter on a retreat that really just cascaded into this deep longing to be in relationship with Jesus, especially Jesus the bridegroom. Like I was just, I was awed at the theology of the body and the call to receive him and to become him and to bring him out into the world. And I was like, I think probably for about four years, I invited everyone I met to come on retreat because I thought, this is where I met Jesus, in Eucharistic adoration. So if I can just get them in front of Jesus, that's what they need. And I made great efforts, and I made some pretty horrible mistakes even, trying to convince people I just had to get them to adoration on a Saturday night with some praise and worship, and their life would be changed. Like, that was the formula, because that's where I encountered him. And I was really deeply committed to, to going to Mass every day for the rest of my life. That was like the longing of my heart. So much so that I was, um, Nick and I would fight about it. It was funny, when we were dating, we'd be like, are you going to the 7 o'clock Mass or the 5.15 Mass? And I'd be like, I'm going to the 7 o'clock Mass in the morning. And he'd be like, well, I have to be at work at 6.45. And I'd be like, well, you're just not as holy as me. You don't go to Mass till the end of the day. 
not really, but there was some tension. And so I fell in love with Jesus, and then through my relationship with Jesus, and really encountering him in the Eucharist, I discerned religious life, I met Nick, we discerned marriage, we got married, we had our kids, and we just set off on this journey in the sacrament of marriage to live our faith. And it never occurred to me that Jesus is longing in the scriptures. If you do your homework in this first quarter, you'll reread the Gospel of Mark, and you'll look at one point during the week for every time that he speaks with longing about sending the Holy Spirit. Oh, how I long to bring you the Spirit, the Counselor, the Advocate, the One. Wait till I go back to the Father. It's better that I go back to the Father, which is crazy, right? So that I can send Him. But for whatever reason, for me personally, I saw the Holy Spirit as like junior varsity God. You know, varsity team, everyone wants to see them play Friday night. We all go watch varsity football. JV plays, and we're all like, I don't have time for that. They're not as good. I saw God the Father, God the Son, and then I was like, and the Holy Spirit. I guess he's in there somewhere too. I had no idea that we share in his body so that he can fill us with his spirit, that we tabernacle his spirit within us, and that when I meet people out there on 23rd Street, maybe he wants me to bring the kingdom into their world instead of trying to connive a way to get them to come on retreat next month. Which retreats are great. I go on retreat multiple times a year as an individual, as a woman, as a wife, and as a mother. We go on retreats. We need to retreat. But those people out there, they need Jesus to meet them in Sam's Club and Costco. Well, we don't have a Costco. Man, I was going to say Costco because we used to have a Costco. Costco is amazing, guys and Trader Joe's. They need us to meet them in Costco and Aldi's and in the gas station. And as I developed this relationship with the Holy Spirit, he started to give me his heart for people. And so one of the first core values that you'll see as you open up your folder is positioned in love. And I can't understate or overstate, I guess I can't overstate this enough, Everything that we do in evangelization and bringing the gospel, beginning with our spouses and our kids and our families and then all the people after that, we have to be positioned in love. When you start to feel your heart ache for somebody and the compassion and the desire that you have for them to know that they are loved, that they are good, that they are chosen, that they are called, you will do some crazy stuff. Like... For example, I was in Burger King in Bluntstown. You guys ever stop at that Burger King in Bluntstown? It's got the really long bathrooms that are always greasy. That's where we stopped until we realized that there's a really nice bathroom stop in Bluntstown. If you're a Bluntstown pastor buyer, I'll tell you where that bathroom is after class. There's a real nice one there. But the Burger King was our stop for a while. And we went in and we were ordering some food and I had just started encounter school because Nick went through it and he told me how awesome it was. And I was like, well, if he thinks it's cool, I'll do it so I can prove him wrong. And when I went into the Burger King, there was this kid making our order. He took our order. He was, was, like, very covered in art, which is beautiful. And he had really nice earrings. And he had on a pink bandana. Um, And as I was talking to him, I felt love for him. Like, he was a little different than the kind of, like, people that I hang out with. But I, like, loved this kid. And he was making the order and stuff. And as I was aware of this love, I was standing there, and the song was coming into my mind. Um, it's, it's an old song from Praise and Worship Days that's called, um, it starts off, The Splendor of the King, Robed in Majesty, Let All the Earth Rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It's called How Great Is Our God, but, or, yeah, How Great Is Our God, sing with me, right? And this song came into my mind, and you'll learn in encounter school, when a song comes to mind, or a movie scene, or you get a memory, or you meet someone, and, like, a word kind of stands out, you'll learn all this kind of cool stuff uh, for evangelizing, because the Holy Spirit, fun fact, the Holy Spirit knows what's going on in everyone's life. 
in exactly what they need and when they need it. And so when your path crosses someone's life, the Holy Spirit may give you some insider information to reach that person, which is another story, again, we'll get back to later. But this guy in Burger King, he's making the order, this song comes to mind, and you'll learn it later on in the semester, the, this kind of prophetic process is very natural, but it just is important to teach because we often aren't taught it because we're not raised in families that are actively evangelizing and living as missionary disciples. But when you get a inspiration or revelation, the next step would be to ask Holy Spirit for an interpretation. What does this mean? What am I supposed to do? And so I was standing there and the song was in my head and I was like, oh wait, hold on, Holy Spirit, like I love this guy and this is a song like, what do you want me to do? And he very gently in that still small voice that you'll learn about in class two tonight from Father Michael, he said, sing it. Now I'm not a singer. Like I just sung a little bit in front of you and that took like some, like, yeah. I was told by my choir teacher, like, you stand in the back corner and just don't sing too loud when I was a kid. I think, <laughs> I have like a little bit of an alto voice or something, I don't know. But, so I was standing there and I just started humming, trying to get the right like key, and then I started singing this song. Not like super weird, I wasn't like standing in Burger King like, la, la, you know, like I was just kind of singing it the way you'd sing a song to yourself, waiting for your food. Not that weird. And the kid turns around and he's like, I know that song. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, like, I remember that song, like, where did I know that song from? And I, was, I sang a little bit more now, because when you step out in the Holy Spirit's boldness and you see somebody respond, like you, you ask them a question and they're like, how did you know? Or you, you invite them to something and they light up, you'll be like, whoa, this is real. Like, I do have insider information. The Holy Spirit is real and wants to, like, love people with me. And so I told him about the song and I was like, yeah, it's like a really old song I got. And funny enough, it was actually the song I got married to. I walked down the aisle to this song. Love this song. And he said, my grandmother used to take me to church all the time. And I was like, oh, really? Like, what church? He's like, well, I mean, I guess I was raised Catholic, but I haven't been. And so then I started to have this conversation with him, and the food came, and the kids were eating. And I was sharing with him just a little bit about my story. I was like, yeah, I was raised Catholic too, and it was kind of meh. And uh, he's like, yeah, I, I've just never really been able to be comfortable in the Catholic church because and he stopped and he like looked at me and he was like, I can't remember why. And I was like, just based on his like body language, I was like, does it have anything to do with like marriage? And he's like, yeah, that's it. My parents, he's like, they divorced. And uh, my dad stopped going to church and I lived with my mom and she stopped going to church because they were divorced and she said, we can't be Catholic anymore because we're divorced. And I was like, that's not the case. Like, you still have a father that loves you and a church that's your home. And I actually happen to know this priest in that church. For those of you who know Bloodstown, the church is like right down the Burger King Road, St. Francis. And I encouraged this kid. I was like, I know this priest. If you go there on Sunday, like, he's awesome. He will like welcome you home and help you get like connected. And he was like, I think, I think I'll do that. I kind of, I don't know. I've, I've been kind of looking, thinking about it a lot lately. And so he had been where he was in his life, making whatever decisions he's making, lonely young adult, working at Burger King, and the Holy Spirit wanted to nudge him to come home. And I got my order and I went home. I didn't like baptize him or like sign him up for RCIA. Like I didn't feel like it was the invitation of the Holy Spirit to track him down three weeks later and be like, did you go back to church? Because the Holy Spirit has a plan for that kid's conversion and his life. And so everything, though, is motivated and positioned for love. And these core values, you want to be aware of God's presence in everything. We want Jesus to do the heavy lifting. So at different points in the classes, we'll stop and we'll be like, let's ask Jesus what he thinks about this. And that's actually something in our leadership training when they're like, well, you'll have questions throughout the year. You'll be like, I'm not sure, Dot. This, this point really challenges me. And one of the first responses is, have you asked Jesus? Like, have you just sat down and be like, Jesus, what do you think about 
fill in the blank, and then wait on him, because he responds, he answers, he brings the response to mind, to heart, and often through other people, which is really cool. We have some great stories of that. And one of the core values is also intimacy with God. We want to acknowledge that everything flows from a deep personal relationship with Jesus, and that's why this whole first quarter is on our identity, who we are, in intimacy with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to be talking week after week about our identity to make sure that we have this foundation. Another core value that we uh, hold in Encounter School is a little bit of risk-taking. The phrase that you'll hear a lot is Holy Spirit-led boldness. We don't want to just be risk-takers for the fun of it, like go out to the kid on the corner and try to pray with him. Go! Like, it's why? Because we're motivated by love and positioned in love, aware of God's presence. But yes, we do take risks. We do say to one of the weeks, uh, your homework will be this week. This is a little bit down the road, so don't run. But this week, um, pray with somebody in the grocery store or in public that you don't know. And again, we're not saying like, so just, you know, pick someone and get it done. But w- be aware of, at that point in your, in your studies, be aware of that, that motion of your heart when somebody's highlighted, they stand out to you in a crowd or their voice stands out to you in a place and you notice them and then you love them with the Father's heart and you become aware of the Father's heart for them and then a step out and a risk. And the cool thing about risk-taking for Jesus is he tells us in the gospel that you're blessed if you're rejected. And I have to say, the closest that I've ever gotten to rejection, I've been aiming for this. I want the blessing of being rejected for Jesus. So I'm, I'm ready to take that risk. The closest I've gotten was like asking a server what I could pray for, because we're Christians and we believe in the power of prayer and that Jesus still moves and speaks today. And he was like, I'm good. And I was like, does that count? Is that rejection? Am I blessed for that one? But I think it was kind of a passive rejection. Also being patient in the process. Patience in the process. As we overcome certain ways of thinking, certain mindsets that we fall into, where we might think like, God can't use me, or I can't do this, or I always mess this up. We're going to draw out some of those old ways of thinking, and we're going to ask for Jesus to transform them. And you need some patience in that process and perseverance for breakthrough. There will be times, and there are times in Jesus' own ministry and in the lives of the saints where it takes more than once. He had multiple uh, miracles that we'll talk about later on in the quarters where there was like, do this, and then do this, and then do this. Or let's do this. I can almost see. Okay, let's pray again. Now I can see fully. Or this one can only be healed through prayer and fasting. And so we'll talk about that God is not a genie in a bottle. We don't get to go up and be like, today, Lord, heal this one. Boom. Like, there's an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit that we'll learn to navigate as students and as a community that is sometimes, often, most of the time, requires patience in the process and perseverance for breakthrough. And we also have a culture of honor. A culture of honor is where we seek one another, we treat one another with the highest regard, knowing that everyone in this room and everyone that we minister to bears the image of God. And we celebrate what God is doing in our lives and in others' lives. And also, one of the core values is Christian unity. The church longs for the unity of believers. And so, as Pope Benedict tells us, we have to be authentically Catholic. We have to be authentically saying, this is who we are and what we believe, while also saying, welcome home. We'd love to have you. And acknowledging that the Spirit has moved and continues to move in many faith communities because the Holy Spirit is drawing his children back home. And so the the fun thing is, as far as Christian unity, if you have a heart for this, um, you will meet so many people as you go through Encounter School that will start to tell you, I I believe this is like a bonus of Encounter School, that will start to use the phrase, I used to be Catholic. I don't know how many times you've heard people say that, 
but like make a mental note and then in a year notice how many more times I believe that the Holy Spirit brings us alongside of people in Sam's Club, in grocery stores, in our workplaces, who maybe you've worked next to them for six years, and for some reason they're going to mention something and be like, yeah, I used to be Catholic. And you'll have the opportunity to be like, oh, really? Like, that's cool. I am Catholic. Like, you want to come? You want to come home? You know, and we'll talk about how that uh, organically happens more throughout the quarters ahead. So sharing these core values with you is important. You also have here in your binder a student handbook. Uh, There's some information on spiritual mentorship, which is available through uh, your student dashboard. When you become an Encounter student, you get a login, and you go to the EncounterSchool.com. You log in. You have a student dashboard. You can go for prayer sessions with trained prayer teams. it's like two hour prayer session on zoom where they will do they will take time to really pray with you through some inner healing i highly recommend you take advantage of access to people that want to pray with you on zoom it's amazing there's also spiritual mentorship that is encouraged and we're going to kind of skim over that tonight i would invite you to read it later and the student handbook, we went over this at the orientation, so we're not gonna take more time tonight to go over the student handbook, but if you would, in your own time, read through the student handbook. Yes, sir. For signing up, it's encounterschool.com forward slash Panama City. I can also, I have a QR code floating around here. I can share the QR code with you. That's a great question. And that's where the, I'm sorry, encounterschool.org forward slash Panama City. So diving into tonight's outline if you flip a little bit further in your folder you every night when you come to class you'll get two outlines to take notes on it will say at the beginning at the top it says quarter one that's q1 class one that's tonight session one that's right now we'll have a little break in a little bit and then you'll have another outline it says quarter one class one session two eventually this will become very natural like you'll show up and you'll be like i need my two session handouts miss dot you won't call me miss dot that'd be weird you just say dot but the teenagers call me miss that. <laughs> so you'll, you'll kind of get in the groove of like taking notes, having your handout. At the bottom of your second handout, there'll always be the homework for the week ahead. And so, for example, if you look, it says homework. It has your supplemental reading. Your reading is on your syllabus. Just like any class, you have a syllabus on the back of your binder. And so supplemental reading, there's books that are recommended, Supernatural Saints, Supernatural Saints by Patrick Rice. There's a paper that you have access to on your student dashboard called Some Implications of Vatican II's Biblical Teaching on the Charism has on lay evangelization and the magisterium of Pope John Paul II. It's just a short little paper, don't worry. And then this book that we'll be reading all quarter that I highly recommend. This is not all stuff you'd read in the next week. You start reading it. This book, Sober Intoxication of the Spirit, by Father Romero Cantalamesa. Father Cantalamesa is the papal preacher. He's the dude who preaches to the Pope. And this is the book that he wrote called Sober Intoxication of the Spirit. And then your, your work this week is there. It says practicum. And the homework will make more sense after the second class, but it says, in prayer, select a specific question or decision about your life that is important to you. In a very direct manner, ask Jesus what his heart is about this decision or question. Journal what you receive in prayer and then summarize. What did you receive? How did you receive it? What did you learn about? How do you hear God's voice? That will make a lot more sense after your second class tonight. So I point out the homework to you because the homework will never be like write a 500-word essay on the relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit. It's not academic homework. It's actually the kind of homework that you 
will enjoy doing in your own prayer life. Like, it's the kind of homework that will prompt you to take a little extra time in adoration this week or to sit a little bit longer with a cup of coffee in the morning and directly ask Jesus about something that's going on in your life. So the homework is very enriching. And that was one of the things that I really saw when Nick was going through the school. He was doing these awesome homework assignments like reading the Bible or praying. And I was like, what? I could do that. For some reason, when I heard the word homework, I was like thinking more essays because I had just finished a master's. So I was thinking more essays and more, you know, research papers and stuff. So for those of you who are concerned about like, will this fit into my life, into my schedule, the reading is beneficial. The talks are very important. Your small group community is a big part of it. We'll be having small group time during class. And the homework is usually in the scriptures or in prayer or in your normal life. There won't be like write a thousand word essay type of homework. Yes. It's on the back of the second handout. So whenever you get your two class handouts on the, yeah, if you just sort of turn to the very back of the whole packet, go all the way over right there so these last two pages in your binder are the handouts for tonight you'll get used to getting your handouts seeing what your homework assignment is coming back next week talking to your small group about how your homework went confessing to your small group that you didn't do it asking someone to text you and hold you accountable giving them the wrong phone number on purpose not really. So let's jump right in to class one, session one, identity and transformation. Your handout looks like this, identity and transformation, quarter one, class one, session one. Yes, Cal? Yes, if you need to grab a pen or you want to grab a water bottle, there's also chocolate in the back. Chocolate is a very important secondary core value of the Panama City campus. Um, it comes from like, I don't know why we, we always have chocolate. That's what we do. That's just, I mean, because who doesn't need some chocolate in the middle of class? Yep. Yes. Stuff, yes, those people. That's okay. Yeah, so we're live streaming right now. So you can either live stream with us if you want to, or every Tuesday the classes will be uploaded to your dashboard and you can watch them at your leisure during the week. So some students rewatch a class, they want to, you know, they dozed off or they just like to listen to it again when we have guest teachers. And then also if you miss a class, that would be how you make it up. Yep on your dashboard. They'll, it will say class one and it'll drop down menu and it'll have two links to the talks and then class two with links to the talks. That you did it. So as we move into small groups over the next three weeks, because we're giving people a chance to come and see and get to know, your small group will really be more who holds you accountable to doing your homework and class participation than Nick or I. So we'll ask you at the end of the year uh, how you feel like you did, like if you went through the material, if you did the homework, if you did the reading, but you'll be checking in with your small groups. Like eventually your small group will be the same set of men and you'll be you know, coming back and being like, oh, yeah, last week was terrible. I didn't get the homework done but I'm going to do it this week, guys. Remind me next week if I don't come, I owe you 20 bucks or whatever. So your small groups will be the ones who will notice, I mean, will notice that you're absent, don't get me wrong, but they'll be growing in relationship. You'll be holding each other more accountable. Nick and I will check on you if you're out of town, and we'd love to know if you know you're going to be out of town. Just shoot us a text so we can make sure you have the link and that you're... Yes, that's the one. Yep. All right. Let's start class one, session one, everyone. Let's just 
focus on Jesus for a second. I invite you to take a moment. You can either turn to him in the tabernacle or look up at our beautiful crucifix. I just invite you to pray out loud. Say, Jesus, I want more of you. Jesus, I want more of whatever you have for me. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to stir up our hearts with holy longing for more. As sons and daughters, we ask you to stir up the desire for a deeper relationship, for more trust, more patience, more joy, more hope, greater faith, more boldness, more of our family to know you, more of our community to know you, Lord overflow. In Jesus' name, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus told his disciples, as you go, make this proclamation, the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, Drive out demons, without cost you have received, and without cost you are to give. We're confident that Jesus has more for you, just like he has more for me. He desires to overflow in our lives. The thing is, I think, sometimes our identity gets chipped away at something someone says, something that happens, an effort that we made that fails, a conversation that crashes and burns, somebody who rejects us, somebody who abandons us, somebody who's hurt us. And slowly we fall back into an orphan mentality, sort of a mindset, not that we have a father in heaven who wants to bless us with every spiritual blessings in the heavens, as the scriptures say, but that we have to take care of it on our own. We have to handle it on our own. We have to prove ourselves to people around us. We have to keep it together. We have to be good enough to not be noticed, but not too good to stand out. And we begin kind of hedging our bets and falling into mediocrity and then discouragement and kind of a disillusionment that leads to like, well, I guess this is as good as it gets. Am I the most joyful person? Maybe not. Am I the best evangelist? No, but I mean, I'm just not, you know, Father Michael. Is my relationship with my spouse the best? No, but, you know, we're still together. Are my kids actively involved in the faith? Not really, but what am I going to do about it? And so my encouragement tonight would be, We're going to talk about having not an orphan mindset, but the mindset of sons and daughters of the Father. And this whole quarter on identity is going to be inviting the Holy Spirit to renew how we see the Father, how we see ourselves, and how we see the world around us. So that when we hear the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons, we don't go... I bet they were pretty cool when you met those people. But we go, that's what I'm called to do. That's how I'm going to live my life. And because the Holy Spirit tabernacles within me, people are going to be healed. We've had healings in the school. We've had healings in Holy Spirit nights. We've had students who prayed for people on airplanes on their own time. And... Holy Spirit showed up and brought amazing healings. 
we've had great, beautiful prayer encounters where we've been ministering with people, students, you guys, a couple weeks from now, ministering with each other, finding freedom from addictions and lies and lifestyles that have enslaved them for decades. Not because, like, Encounter School has the secret sauce. Not at all, actually. It's completely Jesus and the Holy Spirit bringing the kingdom of God, but he does that through you. That's his plan all along. I don't know why. For me personally, my plan would have been different. I would be like, maybe if the roof came off the church and a giant light went into the sky and a booming voice cried out in Bay County, Jesus is here, people would start coming to church. That might work. But for whatever reason, Jesus decided the Holy Spirit tabernacled in the believers of the church, his body. Why are we his body? Because we're united to his body in the sacraments is the way that the kingdom comes. You are kingdom bringers. And while we're sitting around wishing that the second coming would happen, I kind of think, I would say in boldness, this is just me, Jesus is like, yeah, I know, me too. Let's go, guys. Like, let's bring the kingdom. When all things are submitted to him, when the face of the earth is renewed, and those streams of living waters that we read about in the book of Revelation flow into the hearts of believers and then flow out into the dry and thirsty land, we will see the kingdom of God. And we will start to see it in our own lives as we stand up to a temptation, not just because it's wrong and I have to hold on tight and do the right thing, but because our hearts start to be conformed to the truth and what is tempting becomes no longer tempting. Our ethos begins to match our ethic. And one thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to move into the direction of proving our identity by our works. Jesus says to his disciples that there will be people that say to him, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I do mighty works in your name? Didn't I help out at every parish picnic? Didn't I show up to every rosary? Did I volunteer for every food, food distribution? And he will say, I didn't know you. Depart from me. Because all fruitful ministry, all fruitful living, all kingdom bringing flows from knowing him and being intimately in relationship with him. So before we move into learning about the prophetic and how we hear God's voice or how we can evangelize or how we pray for healing or how we do all these really cool things that I, that I firmly believe Jesus is calling us as his missionary disciples to do, we have to start with our identity, who we are, who he is, so that all this fruit can flow like a vine from the roots and the fruit can be good fruit and we will know him. So, what are some of the places that we might be living from? I was reflecting on the outline, I was thinking about, there are times when I live just straight up from obligation or duty. I do what I have to do because somebody expects me to do it, right? Somebody expects me to show up to work, somebody expects me to be a decent mom to my kids. In, there's expectations that are placed on us by spouses, bosses, coworkers, all over the place. And I start to do whatever is expected of me. Sometimes I live out of pride. I do what I do because people see me do it, and I'm good at it. I have really smart kids, and people tell me how smart my kids are, and I'm like, I know, that's why I homeschool them. It's not really why I homeschool them. You can probably learn a lot more at St. John's. Sometimes it's obligation. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's out of insecurity. Like, this is how I find acceptance. This is how I find com 
community, so I have to do all these things. But all of these can kind of be like summed up in this concept of a performance-based mentality, where my worth and my value are derived from what I do. Where my worth and my value are derived from what I do. I see this myself a lot, just observing conversation, working around teenagers. They'll talk about what they do. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, sharing that you play volleyball or sharing that you, um, you know, work for the governor or whatever. But if it's where we find our worth and our value, then we're living from a performance-based mentality. We live this kind of angle of, I do this, this, and this, and this. And so I have people's admiration, people's respect, fast cars, nice houses, lots of friends, many volunteer hours, whatever it is that we gain from what we do, and then we define ourselves. So that's who I am. I am an entrepreneur, I am a teacher, I am a doctor, I am a lawyer, I am a homeschool mom. But the problem with this performance-based mentality is it's exhausting and it kind of hedges out everything that we started off talking about. Being positioned in love and evangelizing and sharing the gospel, motivated by our relationship with the Father. If, if I'm evangelizing because I think that's what's going to make God proud of me, then I'm in it really for me, not for the, the person that I'm meeting at Costco that doesn't exist. I just have to stop saying Costco, guys. I'm sorry. So what we want to ask for in this first quarter is for a renewal of our minds so we can focus on who we are. I am first. Meaning, focusing first on who I am. Not like I am first. Focusing first, who am I? Who am I when everything else is stripped away? Who am I in my core? I am beloved. I am chosen by the Father. I'm called. I am filled with the Holy Spirit, united to Jesus in the Eucharist. I am a part of a church his body, my family, who am I? And then from that, what do I have access to? I have access to heaven. The Holy Spirit tabernacled within me. I'm in Christ, St. Paul says, and he sits at the Father's right hand. We have Dad's ear. We can cry out to him at any point in the day, Dad, I can't handle this. Dad, I'm about to flip out on my spouse. Father, I am about to flip out on my kids. I'm ready to yell at my boss. We have access to the Father all the time. And because of what I have, then what do I do? How do I live my life? How do I respond to my spouse when they're in a bad mood? How do I treat my kids when they're driving me crazy? How do I respond to that teacher who's just telling me I'm not good enough? So living from I am, I have, and therefore, this is what I do. There's this beautiful scripture where we see the prodigal son and we focus a lot on the prodigal son, which is good, rightly so. He asks for his inheritance. He goes out from his father's house. He squanders his inheritance on not so good choices. He's in a faraway land. He's starving. His hunger reminds him of his father's house where there is plenty. And he thinks to himself, at least the servants in my father's house had enough. And he decides he's going to go home. And so he leaves dirty and filthy, broke and starving, and begins a long journey home. A long journey home. And while he's still a far way off, 
and he's scraggly, and he's smelly, and he's skinny, and he's unclean, and he's been gone for a long time. His father sees him coming, and his father rushes out to meet him, and his father embraces him in all of his stink, in all of his filth, in all of his uncleanliness. His father throws his arms around him, and then he cries out to his servants, go and get the fattened calf for my son, who is dead, is home. And he places his robe around him, and he places his shoes on his own feet, which if you just, if you just imagine that, like if you think of coming home and being dirty and having spent everything and having been starving and wasting it all, and even your, you don't even have shoes anymore, and to see your dad bend over and take off his shoes and take your stinky, smelly feet and put his shoes on your feet so you can walk home in his shoes, wrapped in his garment with his ring of authority back on your finger, an authority that you don't deserve anymore. That's how the father sees us as the prodigal son. And many of us have experienced that love and that passion and him saying, you're mine, you're my son, it doesn't matter what your past is, I'm your home. All that I have is yours again. But there's another part of this story. There's an older brother, and the older brother is out in the field when his brother, his younger brother comes home. And He's been working in the field, and he sees that there's a party going on inside, and that the dad is rejoicing, and he's like, what's going on? And the servants are like, hey, your younger brother's home. Now, if you're an older brother, and you've been working for years and years for your father, doing exactly what he tells you to do, like a good son, and your little punk brother who just wasted it all, insulted your father, asking for his inheritance, left home, disappeared. You haven't heard from him in years. Suddenly he's home, and they're rejoicing. The older brother doesn't even want to go in and celebrate. And the father comes out to him, too. The father goes out to him, too. And he asks him why he won't come back inside and celebrate for his younger brothers come home. And his answer to me is so convicting. He says, my son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. When I hear the older brother, the way he says to his father, look, all these years I've served you, and not once did I disobey you. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But this son of yours returns. He swallowed up your property with prostitutes. For him, you've slaughtered the fattened calf. calf. There's something in my heart that stirs at those words. As a cradle Catholic, as a church-going mom who's trying my best, to raise my kids in the faith, to be a good wife, to work for the church. There's a place even still where I'm like, Lord, I'm trying so hard. And I hear the Father's heart in the reply where he says, everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. There's an implication to that that I hear with conviction that's kind of like, you haven't asked for very much, buddy. Why are your expectations so low? You want a fattened calf? Yeah, let's go. You want to have a party with your friends? You're my son. Everything I have is yours. For me, it's a reminder that Jesus died. We started off this class focusing on Jesus so that I could have access to the Father. Jesus died to bring me back into the family. St. Paul tells us in Ephesians, I'm going to try and find the slide for you. Hang with me. 
May the eyes of your heart be enlightened. We can just make that a prayer, like, Lord, enlighten the eyes of my heart. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened that you may know what is the hope that belongs to his call. What are the riches of glory in his inheritance among the holy ones? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power for us who believe in accord with the exercise of his great might? St. Paul is speaking to us. What is the surpassing greatness of his power for us here in this room, in this church? The riches of the glory of the inheritance that Christ has won for us. We use this analogy a lot between uh, uh, inheritance and life insurance. Have you guys heard this analogy? Life insurance, what do we do with life insurance? We pay in a little bit every month, and then at the end, hopefully, somebody gets a payout, right? It's sort of like a buy-in, little by little, and then there's a big payout at the end mentality. A lot of Catholics live their faith like this. I go to church on Sundays. I go to confession once a year. It's like just a little investment in my faith life. And then hopefully at the end, I get through the door. And apparently there's something good up there for me. Not sure what it is. That's not our Catholic faith. Jesus did not die so that you could go to church every Sunday, meet your obligations, and hopefully in the end get to enjoy something of him. He died to open heaven to us and to fill us with his Holy Spirit. There's this amazing book, um, Wellspring of Worship, that's not on your reading list because it would take all two years to read through. But he makes this amazing point that the whole story is like this one continuous motion that Christ enters into our humanity and then in our humanity experiences death and then comes out of death in the resurrection and then ascends to the Father and then pours out his divinity in the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, bringing these two realities back into union, into communion, that we have access now to the life of the Trinity when we receive him in the Eucharist and we're filled with his spirit in our baptism, confirmed with his spirit, and then walk in that identity out into the world. We are tabernacles of his presence out there. We are kingdom bringers out there. It's the inheritance, the riches of the inheritance that we have. It's not life insurance. It's an inheritance. When you get an inheritance, you get it like now. There's a now to the kingdom. We get to experience his presence, his power, his authority, his glory, his goodness, his friendship, his consolations, even amidst the darkest trials of our life. Now, with him. St. Paul tells us in Romans, those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. He invites you not to be the older brother who stands outside the house and says, hmm, maybe someday, but to come in now to the party. Come in now to the Father's presence. Come now to the Father's house and enjoy the Father's word saying, everything that I have is yours. To enter into this relationship, we have to allow for the Holy Spirit to transform our way of thinking. We will very quickly, like 30 minutes from class ending, fall back into an orphan mindset. I got to do it on my own. It's all up to me. God just expects me to get it done, be a good person, be a nice person, get to church on Sundays, as though we don't have the inheritance that has already been given to us. And so we read in Corinthians, whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. 
Those are bold words. You can just sit with those words for a while. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. All of us, gazing with unveiled faces on the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, as from the Lord, who is the Spirit. There's a reason that we call encounter, encounter. It's because it's the Lord, who is the Spirit, who does the transformation. Like, it's not our really cool outlines. They're good outlines. It's not our nifty slides. It's not your really fancy binder that we got at Sam's Club for you, not Costco, because we don't have a Costco. It's the Lord who transforms us. It's intimacy with him. And as we encounter him, there's also a renewal of our thought life. The fourth quarter is an inner healing quarter where we spend a lot of weeks talking about our thought life and the thought patterns and the lies that we've come to believe based primarily on the teaching of Dr. Bob Schutz, who is deeply rooted in the teaching of the Catholic Church. Your books and a lot of your lectures will be materials that he worked with Encounter to develop for the inner healing quarter. And it will be this renewal of our mind where St. Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may demonstrate that you may demonstrate what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When we start to see our troubles, our relationships, our difficulties at work, our financial issues from heaven's perspective, instead of from our orphan perspective, we will start to experience a newness and a transformation in those relationships and in those workplaces and in those finances and in those places of addiction where we are seeing with the Father's perspective one of love and one of power, one of the Spirit bringing us from glory to glory. So this whole program is this renewal of our mind. We have these lectures and these talks and then these times that we'll often we call this activation. Activation is not something you can do. You can't transform yourself. We're not butterflies, and even butterflies don't transform themselves. Fun fact. It's like this weird bacteria that lives on them. I lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> we can't transform ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit who transforms us. We can't activate heaven on earth except by our yes. He, he desires our yes, our cooperation, our willingness, and a little bit of time. So we'll have periods at the end of class that, that are just called activations. It's just the word that they're called. But it's giving Jesus a chance to have some time with us. Giving him a chance to have access to our imagination. Or to bring him our problem. Or to wait on his voice. So there are different activations at the end of every class and we're about to actually move into an activation so you'll kind of see what I'm talking about but as you hear this word don't be confused it's not like you have to activate there's like some movie where they're like activate it's like Paw Patrol they like transform and their little like doggy wings come out and they're like activate that's not it it's just giving Holy Spirit time and access and the really cool thing is, like, talking to students from year one, a lot of them admit, like, prior to coming through the school, they're like, I didn't really listen much in prayer. So, like, when we say, pray out loud, Holy Spirit, whatever, 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 and then we give you a long period of silence to listen to him, a lot of our year one students gave us feedback. They're like, that was amazing because it's like whenever I come to prayer, I like recite my prayers and I say what I want to say. And then I'm like, we good? We good. Okay. And then I leave. And then I wonder why I can't hear God's voice or I'm not sure what to do. Or, and so a lot of the time of activation is really just literally giving time to listen or to focus on a scripture or focus on a truth 
there will be other activations too later in the semester where you'll, you'll pray with each other or whatnot. Don't worry about that right now. But we want to allow not just for the knowledge to come into our head and to, to learn some catechism quotes and some lives of the saints and some scriptures and to be like, cool, I went to school today. But for that knowledge to have time to seep down into our hearts. And that space from our head to our hearts is the work of the Holy Spirit, is the work of intimacy with Jesus. And that's why the homework, like we were talking about, a lot of the homework, like this week, is in your prayer time. Take time to ask Jesus this. Because getting it from our head to our heart and allowing our thought life to be transformed and then our hearts to be conformed to his truth is him working in us, with us, and through us. So, as we move into this fun time of activation, going back to this story of the prodigal son and the younger son who comes home, dirty, filthy, having spent it all, but is embraced by the father, and the older son who has worked and tried to prove himself, there's a couple images that I want to bring out before we go into a moment of prayer. The robe, the sandals, and the ring. When we hear about the robe in the scriptures, a lot of times this reminds us of our priestly identity. That in our baptism, we are priest, prophet, and king because we share in Christ's life and his identity, and he is the priest, the prophet, the king. And so we participate in that when we are baptized. And so our priesthood that is restored to us in our baptism we see the father placing his robe around the son. And this is where we can live out of bringing God's presence, allowing his presence to seep out of us and to sanctify our lives, our world, our families, the normal stuff that we do, where it becomes motivated by love and wanting to give glory to God and bring honor to God. And then the sandals that are placed upon his feet reminds us of our prophetic identity. Like the prophet Isaiah tells us that beautiful are the feet of, I'm pretty sure it's the prophet Isaiah, tells us that beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the good news. We receive this prophetic identity in our baptism, have received it, and the ring that is placed on our finger of his authority and his power. When a father wanted to make a trading deal with a guy who lived across the Mediterranean Sea in some other town, and he would send his son, and he'd say, son, go and make this deal. Here's 13 camels and 12 bags of grain. He would place his ring of authority on his son's finger so that he could show the other person, like, I represent my father in this land. And so we receive the authority of the father as we are united with the Son in our baptism. And we are called to be kings, not kings who sit up on a throne and are worshiped by our subjects who offer a sacrifice. That's like only, you know, for parents and kids. But kings who want the good of their people and desire their kingdom to thrive and serve their people. So I wanna invite you just to set aside your notes, set aside your pens, we're going to take a moment. Throughout the school, you'll hear the phrase, just move into your prayer posture. Your prayer posture might not be exactly this, but I would encourage you to start with the idea of closing your eyes and opening your hands just on your lap. Keeping our eyes closed helps us not to be distracted and also allows for our imagination to have a space. And opening our hands keeps us, A, from doing other things with our hands, like on our cell phones, but also is a sign of receptivity. So just as we're in our prayer posture, I want you to just take a deep breath and invite the Holy Spirit Come, Holy Spirit.
we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to lead us in the story of the prodigal son to see our place in the story. So I invite you to pray out loud. Holy Spirit, please show me where I am in this story. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey to a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that foreign country, who sent him into the field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him any. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and returned to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. We're going to pause for a few minutes and let God speak to us. What does it look like to be in this story? Who's there with you? What does it feel like? Now there was an older son who was in the field, and he came, and he drew near to the house. He heard the music and dancing, and he asked one of the servants what these things meant. The servant said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back. 
but the older son was angry and refused to go inside. His father came out to him and entreated him, saying, Come inside. But he answered his father and said, All these years I have served you. I've never disobeyed you, and yet you've never given me even a young goat to celebrate with my friends. But then this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, and for him you killed the fattened calf. And the father said to him, Son, you are with me always, and all that I have is yours. We invite the Holy Spirit to reveal whatever truth he wants to speak to each of us tonight. Have our hearts wandered like the prodigal son? Are we realizing how exhausted we are living like orphans out in the world? Trying to earn our identity, trying to provide for ourselves, trying to satisfy unquenchable hungers. If this is where we are, we acknowledge it and we turn back to the Father. He's waiting for us to come home. Or are we like the older son who is exhausted by trying to do everything perfectly on our own without acknowledging the Father's goodness and generosity? And then we only have to ask. I invite you to pray with me tonight. Father, how do you want me to receive my inheritance? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be.
world without him. Amen. Amen. We are going to take a little bit of a break. Your next teacher is going to get ready. Father Michael is going to be leading you guys through the next session. Um, there's chocolate in the back and water bottles. There's restrooms around the corner here. If you're not familiar with St. John's, there's also a restroom over on this side. Um, I would invite you, if you want to stay in the church, uh, let's keep the church just as a place to sit and be with the Lord. If you want to pray, if you want to reflect more on the prodigal son and what the Lord's speaking to you. But the foyer is open grounds for conversation, discussion, and chit-chatting. So if you'd like to stay in here, we'll keep the church prayerful, and you're welcome to move into the foyer, grab some water and chocolate, and go to the bathroom. And then we'll start back in about 10 minutes.
Check one, two. Okay. Easy.
check. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, please. for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Only stand up as we begin this next session here. You've been sitting, got a little chocolate back in, and we just continue to pray. And just uh, a little that simple little, little uh, that doxology. So I would just sing that. If you don't know it, it's a great one to learn, a great one to just kind of be rooted in. You don't need a band. You don't need anything to just, it's just very, very, that simple melody. It's just, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Lord God, we give you praise that we're here in your midst, we're here with each other. Open up our minds and hearts to hear your voice and to hear your delight and your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so 
Um, let's do a quick little recap of what we just heard. Give me the top 22 things of what Dot, Dot just shared with you. No, and, and anything, anything that kind of like, that you want to just put in the memory bank, you want to take to prayer later on, you want to spend some more time with. Yes? Okay, the older brother and the prodigal son story. Yeah, my son, you are here with me always, and everything I have is yours. It might be my favorite. It might be my personal favorite line in all the New Testament. There's and there's something about yours for the asking. There's something about that about like this. Yeah, anyone else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that being able to listen, um, to be able to, to speak our hearts, our hurts, our pains, our hopes, our brokenness, but then not actually being able to listen. You guys have had this happen before. I know I've had it happen where that person comes up to you and they're like, Myra, oh my gosh, here's all my problems, here's all my problems, here's all my problems, and then walks away. So they've basically just dumped these problems on you, like, and then just sort of, like, it's such an unnatural way. Now, sometimes you just need that, and you know Myra can take it, and, and anytime she's feeling, she, but to, if that's the only, imagine if that, if so you had someone in your life, that's the only way they approached you. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, oh, here they come. You know, again, but God is infinitely, pa he's not like us, he's infinitely patient and just, and even if we're just like, oh, blah, 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 we never listen, He's still loving us there. But there's something about that in the sense that there's a, a gap, a space of what's not being received, not because he's not giving it, not because he's withholding it, but because we never take that, never take that chance to breathe in and receive and bask and listen. Okay, and anything else from, yeah? Kingdom bringers. Yeah, there's something, yeah, there's something. I, I think hopefully as, as you're kind of hearing this, we're kind of hearing obviously that we're rooted in identity. We're going to talk about hearing the voice of God in our, in our brief time together. Um, but it, it starts to, in a sense, kind of bring an importance to everything we're doing, not as a self-importance of look how great I am, um, but just look how mighty God is that he wants to enter into even the most mundane and simple of situations and do something beautiful there. Juan, you had your hand up. Yeah. Absolutely. Who am I? And how do I learn that? How do I, how do I understand that? How do I live that? And maybe kind of what's also going to ping with this, what's going to pop up is the mistaken notions of identity. Those mistake, those places where maybe you've believed a false identity. And you've, and I, I've had this happen before where I was doing something well and people were liking me for it and saying, you're good because you're doing this thing. And I started to be like, heck yeah, this is, this is great, and this is who I am. So that, that's, that's sometimes even more dangerous when you're really good at something. That's, that's one of the reasons why being a workaholic is one of the most difficult kind of addictions, because guess what? You get paid for it, right? Other addictions, that not, not as much, like, right? You know, if you don't pay, you generally be an alcoholic or, you know, whatever. But workaholics, they're getting paid. You get a raise. You get accolades at work. It's like, oh, everyone else went home. This guy came in on Saturday. He's a real, like, that sort of thing. Oh, man, I'm good. I'm important. I'm loved. See how many dollars I've loved. You know, that, that, that tendency that we have. Now, here, that goes back to, think of even the way we learned this in school. You got to see. Or, hey, you got an A. You got, a, you got a gold star, you know? Or like, oh, man, you, you got in trouble again. Or you have, like, there's these parts of us that says, like, if I do good, I am good. Which is so close to the truth, and yet it is a lie from the pits of hell. It's so close, but it's a lie from the pits of hell. So recognizing that I am good, and there, because of that, from that, because God, I'm good, because God has created me, and he makes me, when he makes me, he says, I'm very good. And because of that, I can do good. And the good things that I do flow from that, flow from identity. All right. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I agree with that. I think we can't spend enough time, we cannot spend enough time 
um, on Luke chapter 15, which is just that beautiful accounting of, of the prodigal son. And Jesus tells three stories in that, and that, that's the three parables take up basically the whole chapter, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. And it starts off, um, just, just, and I just want to go to this as we kind of get into uh, this, this uh, section on, on my, my sheep here and my voice. Let's go to real quick. You've got your Bibles with you to Luke 15. And you can just read that for the rest of the time, not listen to anything I say, and you'll be probably better off for it. But Luke 15 is so great because it begins, Luke 15, 1. <clears throat> it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. That's Luke 15, 1 and 2. And I love that line, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And I think it's John Chrysostom. I might, be, I might be confusing him with another church father, so I apologize, but they're in heaven now, so they don't really care if I misquote them too badly, right? Um, but uh, that, that said, one of the early church fathers, fourth century, said that that line, this man receives sinners and eats with them, should be chiseled on the front of every altar of every Catholic church throughout the world. So when we encounter our God, because then Jesus spends these next three stories describing what kind of God, what God is like, what the Father is like. And so to be able to experience that, oh man, I'm the sinner, and so I'm in the right place. Not like, look how good I am, so I'm in the right place. I would say that if, if we walk into church and we've got no sins or no struggle, no brokenness, no hurts, no pains, if you didn't yell at somebody that week, if you didn't you know, have a mistake, a misstep in marriage or in work or in life, then you're in the wrong place. We have nothing for you. <laughs> we have nothing for you. The, this, the, only way, the only entrance into this church is a broken heart, a heart that is broken open. And we, as we enter into the church, we enter into the broken open heart of Jesus. Jesus' heart was not broken by his own sin, but by loving the sinful. By and he does that in the sense he becomes sin, as St. Paul says. He, he knew no sin, but he became sin for our sake. So that our broken hearts, so when you walk into this church and you see Jesus dead on the cross, when you encounter Jesus crucified and, and, and resurrected in the Holy Eucharist, he still has that wounded heart, which I absolutely love. Okay, so the goal of this session is to allow the Lord, and this is always a movement of the Holy Spirit, to convince us that he loves you, that he's speaking to you, and that he wants you to hear his voice. Okay, he, God wants you to hear his voice. Now, here's the thing. When we hear the voice of God, it's not always something cute and nice and sweet. It's not always the inside of a, uh, you know, like a, a, a Hallmark card where he's like, oh, hey, buttercup, I was just thinking about you today. And you're just like, oh, that's so sweet. I love you too, God, right? Sometimes it is that. Sometimes it is that place of deepest intimacy. But there's something amazing. I was thinking when we talk about hearing the voice of God, the voice of God that speaks that still small voice. And we're going to spend a little time, again, this activation at the end of, of this talk that, uh, that Dr. Nick's going to lead us through, that speaks and it's something simultaneously consoling and healing and terrifying terrifying in like the most foundational sense and that's something that God is somebody other he's other he's not something that you control we can't manipulate him we can't force him to speak so again everything that we're hearing is for uh, to prepare us to receive what God is already doing it's not like God's like man I will talk as long as you get the spell right as long as you say this prayer in the right order, it's like, ah, you unlocked it, and now I'll speak to you. No, 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 that, that's not Christianity. That's something else. I don't, I don't know what that is. It's, it's a trap. It's a lie. It's paganism. It's witchcraft. It's a, the occult. It's all those things. If I can do the right things in the right order, it's that God, your Father, speaks this blessing over us, and we need to allow the Holy Spirit to open up, cultivate, excavate our hearts in order to be able to receive that and hear that, what he's already doing. But that, so we're hoping to, to drive home that God wants to speak to you, is speaking to you, and that you can hear him. And, and so we're, we're stepping into that. So back to Job, why I love that, because there's a great part in Job. We're kind of like Job, part, the whole book of Job. Some of you might be going through those Job moments in your life right now, where you just feel like everything's falling apart. You feel like just, you know, your body's failing you. I, I, I love that. I love, I don't love, I hate, but it's the, it's the love that the Lord gave it to us where Job's has death in his family, financial ruin, his body is racked. Those that he loved are telling him to curse God and die. 
He's being accused by those that are closest to him, his dearest friends, that you must have done something wrong. He feels utterly hopeless and alone. And he's basically, he's like, God, like, what the heck, man? And there's this, like, this goes over for chapter after chapter after chapter. Then finally, God says, all right, Job, gird up your loins now like a man, for the Lord your God is going to answer you. This is not this cute little hallmark God that gives you nice, pious platitudes. This is the God who is, and when he speaks, it's beautiful and healing and terrifying all at once. And it's the best to be able to be aware of the voice of God fills you with a strength and a conviction even in the darkest moments that you can continue to move forward. So just kind of this, this line here, I think that communication is the foundation of all relationships. So we, we have this... Uh, just kind of this, we want you guys to be fruitful in your ministry. That every, that fruitful meaning bearing fruit. That's the first command that God gives uh, creation, gives us in, the, in creation, is be fruitful and multiply. And I think about that even kind of in the new creation, that he's calling us to be fruitful in our, our sphere of influence, the place that we are, our work, our family. So that flows from relationship. All fruitful ministry flows from relationship with God. And since communication is at the heart of all relationships, then believing we can hear God's voice is essential to fruitful ministry. <clears throat> so just thinking about that, again, that, that it's, it's kind of very basic and very simple to think that it's impossible to have a relationship with somebody if you don't talk to them. It's very simple, right? Almost goes with, I mean, kind of like it's so simple that it, it why even say it? But it's so true. And the more that we can talk with somebody, the more that relationship grows. Now, the opposite, kind of the other side of this, if you have a relationship with somebody, you're like, man, the more I talk to them, the more I just can't stand them. Then you can realize, oh, that, that's not a good relationship, right? You know, <laughs> like I saw a picture of her and she was beautiful. And then we started talking. I was just like, oh my gosh, get me out of here, right? Like, it's like, okay, this is probably not true love. Probably not. But you've had those moments, hopefully you've had those moments of a, a, a relationship, an encounter with a person that the more you spoke, the more deeply moved you were by that person, the more fascinated you were by them. And what you said was fascinating to them. There was this reciprocity. And so you probably had this. We used to have these things for the younger ones here. You won't re remember these things. We used to have these things called telephones in the house. And it was like, mine, I was very modern, so we had a portable telephone, right? But we didn't each have our own phones in our pockets. And so there was only one phone line in the whole house. So if your parent got on the other end of the line, they would all of a sudden hear you. And that was very embarrassing, tried to avoid that. But those moments where you're talking to somebody on the phone into the wee hours of the morning, and there's just, just this like, it's like, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Like this like, I don't want to stop this conversation because there's this like, I feel I'm being seen and known and loved and cherished by, by this other person. And we're talking about silly stuff. You're talking about profound things. You're talking about the past or the future. And every word draws you deeper into that relationship. And it's beautiful. There's something beautiful about that. And in a sense, I think so, so often we haven't yet had that experience with God. And God wants it. He wants much more than that. He doesn't just want the you hang up kind of thing. He wants this, this, this place because you think of that relationship sets the stage for that place of saying, will you marry me? Or that place of saying, it's a boy. Or that place of saying, it's cancer. It's that place of saying, I love you. Like the, that whole stretch of that relationship is prepared for and builds on that, the reciprocity of being able to communicate. So that's what God wants. Again, we, we get the sense that we're made in the image and likeness of God, which is why relationships, good relationships, give us a sense of what our, our relationship with God should be. So we see this especially in the prophets. So the prophetic call is those who hear the voice of God and share his message with the world. And we were baptized, and we talked about that. I love that, those images of the sandals, of the ring, of the robe, of this. We were baptized priest, prophet, and king. We received that identity at our baptism. Who here was baptized as a baby? Baby baptism? I was not a baby when I was baptized. Who, who here was an adult? Any adults or toddlers? You were an adult when you were baptized? Love it. I was, I was like a, I was a, a rocking horse Catholic, as the phrase goes. I was six years old when I was baptized, so not quite an adult. Um, but there's something about that, no matter what age you're baptized at, where God gave you everything. He gave it all to you. 
He holds back nothing. He gave you everything that belongs to Jesus Christ by his nature is given to you completely and totally by grace. There's something beautiful about the baptism of a baby that conveys that in a really profound way, that they can do absolutely nothing to deserve it. No matter what age you are, whether you're an adult or a six-year-old or a baby, it's, it holds true that you do nothing to earn that or deserve it. It's not that you're like, oh, okay, this baby's very intelligent. They passed this catechism quiz, so now we give them baptism. It's this free gift of love and delight from God. And so recognizing that part of that is that prophetic reality that's already been entrusted to you. And you think of the prophets throughout the whole Bible, they are those who, hearing the voice of God through this relationship with God, not because of their own perfection, not because they have it all figured out. Oftentimes the prophets are wounded and fallen people, actually all of them are, um, that's, and responding to his voice, responding to his voice. And I think that that's so key. I think there's great examples of this. I think oh, one, of, one of my favorite examples is the prophet Jonah. If you don't know Jonah's story, it's, one, it's a pretty short book in the Bible. So it's so great because God's like, Jonah, I called you by name. You are mine. I'm going to go with you, send you to Nineveh. And uh, Jonah's like, no thanks, and then runs the other direction, right? He goes the other direction, and it's so beautiful because God, what God is doing there, through the story of Jonah, through Jonah's disobedience even of not responding to God's call for him to be a prophet, God's using that to show something profound about who God is. The book of Jonah is one of the kind of primary texts for the understanding that God is not just conf- confined to like a geography, that God is God of everything, every time and every space. He's not just this God of this, this people, he's God of the whole universe. And we see that because as he runs from God, God's like, oh, Jonah, I love you so much. So I'm gonna, this storm comes up and they cast lots. And they find out it's Jonah's fault. He's like, it's me, I'm running from God. And they're like, oh man, we're gonna do? He's like, throw me overboard. They do, he's like, better kill me. Yeah, you know, just, just go and kill me. And then like God's like, even this place where Jonah, you've run away from my, my, my message, you've done everything, you've tried to have yourself killed, you're in the deepest, darkest pit of the sea, you're eaten by a sea monster. It doesn't get much lower than that. It's like from there, Jonah begins to pray. God hears Jonah's prayer. And then Jonah's spit up on the land. And God's like, all right, so where were we? Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Like he picks right back up. And there's something so beautiful about that, that it's sometimes even our like refusal, and this is one of God's mercies. I've seen this a lot of times in my life. Even the times where I've refused to listen to him, I've kind of like held him at arm's length. He somehow has used that. I've had, I've, I've had experiences, again, I do this professionally, priest stuff, right? I've had moments where I've just been in a, just in a pit of like sin and grossness and just myself and selfishness. And, and we're like, God has used me in that moment and put someone in front of me to do something miraculous. Not me, but God, but using me, not apart from me, like somehow. It's like, it's so gratuitous, but it so lets me know, oh, this isn't about how holy I am and how amazing I am. It's how generous God is. Okay, so this is, it's essential. Hearing God's voice is essential to fulfill this prophetic call in our lives. But it's also important to recognize that we have a culture of disbelief, not just out in the world, that people out in the world don't believe you can hear the voice of God, but oftentimes even within the church. Sometimes it kind of becomes some sort, almost like, a, like a, a false humility. Like, oh, God doesn't talk to me, but, he, you know, like, it's okay. I don't need to hear God's voice. And there's something about that. It's like, it's like that's, not, that's not being humble. That's, in a sense, like kind of inoculating ourselves to that disturbing voice of God in my life. Because if I never have to hear the voice, of, if I can never hear the voice of God, can never hope to hear the voice of God, and any time the voice of God speaks, I'd be like, oh, that's not the voice of God. Particularly when he's like, oh, I want you, to go, want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to go do something that you don't want to do. I'd be like, oh, no, God's not, t- not talking to me, right? So there's something about that, even within, within a, a believing community, where we can inoculate ourselves, have a culture of not believing that we hear the voice of God. Now, obviously, too, part of that, and it's important to say it, Part of that comes from maybe an abuse of that where we've seen, where we've seen people who like blame, I love when people blame stuff on the Holy Spirit. They're like, oh, you know, they did something. You're like, what are you doing? They're like, oh, God told me to do this. Or like, God has a message for you. And they share something that's obviously not a message from God because it's not in line with God's teachings. It's not in line with the Bible. It's, you know, all, all sorts of things. It's not true. It has to be good and true and beautiful. All the, all, you know, the ways of discerning it. So kind of recognize. So sometimes in order to sort of distance ourselves from 
badly used prophetic uh, utterances so called from people we can kind of say well god would never ask me to do that unfortunately he still does and still and still wants to work so a couple of false beliefs we'll get into this a bit more first first false belief is that god doesn't want to speak to you doesn't want to speak to us there's a couple things within this and this this brings up especially as we, we were looking at that prodigal son image of both how God is so tender, the father so tender with the, the son who stays and acts like a slave and is miserable, and the son who leaves and believes everything the world tells him and he's miserable. There's that, that tragic moment in both of their stories where the sons are outside of the father's house. The prodigal son's kind of the more famous one. He's way outside the father's house. He's out there in some faraway city He's with prostitutes and all this stuff, and he's just empty and sad and alone and broken and starving. And then he comes to his senses, coming to his senses, he says, even the slaves in my father's house have a better life than this. So he starts going back. The, the kind of further tragedy is the son who stayed and never went anywhere, who's in the father's house, but it's like he's living not as a son, but as a slave. That's a tragic way to live. It's a tragic way to live. So sometimes our image of God, our, our thoughts about who God is, that, that God's in a bad mood, he's displeased, it is, we haven't attained the necessary holiness to hear from him. Also, too, we talked a lot about this, this performance mentality, this performance-based mentality, that I have to perform well enough in order for God to speak to me. Okay, another false belief is that we can't just straight up, we can't hear from God. So in the Old Testament, he speaks pretty rarely. It's to a couple of the prophets and to nobody else. So we understand, and this is really important to, to recognize, that God speaks to all, not because we've deserved it, but because we're united to Christ. So to say, God doesn't speak to me, God doesn't hear me, God doesn't love me, are not pious or humble things to say, that is to say, God, God does not speak to his son. God does not love his son. His son cannot hear him. Because guess what? God makes no differentiation between the son. God the Father makes no difference between the son and us. So sometimes we think God never speaks to me as some sort of just kind of like, ah, here's a better way of saying that. Like, I'm not very good at hearing God yet. That's, a, that's perfectly acceptable. That's a perfectly acceptable thing. So if you've said to yourself, God never speaks to me. Maybe to switch that with, I'm a newbie, I'm a novice at hearing the voice of God. I'm learning to do that. And again, we're going to have activation tonight led by Dr. Nick, just, just as, as, as a step into those waters. And the beautiful thing about these simple activations and prayers is you can do them at any time. You can do them at any time. You can just kind of like step into it. I got 20 minutes. Whew, all right, I'm going to read through the prodigal son and I'm going to see where do I find myself reflect on the, the ring and the robe and the, the sandals okay also this is a, another lie that we believe i'm not someone special um here's the thing you're made by god in his image and likeness he created this whole universe that you might exist true humility is seeing ourselves and knowing ourselves as god sees us and god knows us and how does god see you how does he know you he knows and sees you he sees your dirt I mean, you did not create yourself. I didn't make myself. But your beloved dirt, your dirt that has been made in his image and likeness, were so gratuitous and so essential at the same time. Only church leaders can hear from God. I can say as a church leader that like becoming a priest did not all of a sudden like up my hearing God level by 20% or whatever. That would be great if, it, if, if that had happened. In a sense, like it, it, it's a, it con continuous with what he's already been doing in baptism. Everything that we're talking about right, right now is an activation, is a pushing into, a pressing into what you received at your baptism, what was sealed in on the day of your confirmation. Okay. Another false belief, God only speaks under certain circumstances. So whatever, so God only speaks when like, when I'm praying, when I've got my hands folded, when I'm kneeling, when I'm in a church. Now, is praying, having my hands folded, being in a church, are those good things? Absolutely. And is, is there certain aspects of our environment that affect our ability to, to open ourselves up to hear? Absolutely. But God is speaking at all times. He never ceases to speak over his beloved, over his, his beloved son, which we are in the son. 
So to, to limit it to that, because man, what if you started listening for the voice of God? Just being in church would be good. Well, if you haven't do that, you don't do that. But like throughout the day, what a difference that would make, potentially. And or God only speaks in certain ways, through Scripture, church leaders, or through nature, and that's kind of it, right? Um, through songs, God speaks to me through music. Sometimes we even kind of like maybe you've heard the voice of God in a certain way, but we make that it in our lives. God speaks to me through music, or God speaks to me through scripture. Yes, yes, praise God for that. And Lord, I want, you, I want, to, I want to hear you sing in every moment, in every situation of my life, to not limit myself. <clears throat> okay, so you want to talk a little bit about the connection between faith, hope, and love, and hearing his voice? So this starts with faith. Obviously, you have to have faith. We have to believe that God is real, that he is, is uh, that he loves you. He created you out of love and for love. He wants a relationship with you. He sent his son to die for you. All the professions of faith that we have have to be that, that, that foundation. So this, uh, so this well, kind of, we have this little simple formula. Yeah, we got it right there. So faith, hope, and love. That's the three um, theological virtues. So faith, my understanding of who God is and my relationship to him. It's a good, good kind of encapsulation of what we mean by faith. So hope is the expectation of God to break into my life. The, the hope for a savior, the hope for a redeemer, the hope that even the worst moments of my life, even the darkest moments I might be going through, you might be going through them right now, that God is still working in the midst of that. Not this mere like, I'm in this dark place and maybe one day God will find me. It's that God has already gone to the darkest place. So in a sense, learning to hear God's voice, especially in dark moments, is learning to experience and accept and know and receive the love of God for me at my worst. At my worst. And of course, love, the encounter of God's breakthrough in my life. Faith, hope, and love. Those, you know, and the greatest of these is love. I love that. The encounter of God's breakthrough in my life. Okay, I'm going to go through some scripture passages here, because it's important for us to, to be rooted in that. Why don't we go to John 10? Do we have, do we have that up there? Yeah, I think we can bring that up there. <clears throat> All right, so we have this scene here in John 10, where Jesus is talking about, about this, this, what for them is a very common image, the common image of the good shepherd. The, the, the sheep hear his voice and know his voice. And there's something about this, about the good shepherd, about this, this image of the shepherd that's so kind of, it's so raw. Like we don't, I think we kind of have romanticized it. Every image of Jesus, the good shepherd I've ever seen. He's like the shepherd with like the best looking hair that any shepherd's ever had before. He just got his nails done. He's looking good, right? He's, he's got this one sheep on his shoulders shoulders just like just like this very chill sheep like there's something i don't think we recognize how brutal of a job this is how brutal of a job being a shepherd is i think i think if you like you watch those shows i have like the uh, the deadliest catch i haven't really watched it I, I know that it exists you know what i'm talking about it's like the alaskan uh, uh, crab fishermen and they're just like out there and it's dangerous and the water's rushing over and they're pulling in their hands are broken and blistered and bleeding and this this whole sort of thing that like they're against the elements and against each other there's this kind of and because jesus talks about this within within this context there's other shepherds there's bad guys out there who will try to steal his sheep you know, the wolf and the hireling, the things that, that attack those that he loves. And so this, this recognition of, of maybe kind of relearning, so when Jesus uses this image, it should kind of provoke something. There's something provocative in it that I think we've kind of anesthetized by well-meaning but kind of sappy art, right? That it's, it's, it's such a kind of a brutal prof profession that, that things that want to destroy my sheep, that I have to kill them, or my sheep will be killed. Again, that, that kind of way of living. I don't, I don't live that way. I don't, I don't, I don't, I've got a couple of blisters on our last mission trip to Perry. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never doing this again, right? So there's something about that. So this, this voice of the good shepherd. When he has driven out all his own, he walks ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. But they will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they do not recognize the voice of strangers. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. 
Why don't you just take a moment? Why don't you just close our eyes just for a second? Okay, just to hear that. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So just think for yourself, what does the voice of the shepherd sound like? What, what places in your heart begin to move when you hear God speak? There's this great tradition in the church of discernment, the discernment of spirits, and the great St. Ignatius of Loyola is really good at uh, beginning to help us excavate how we hear the, the Lord's voice versus how we hear the enemy's voice. I want you to just have this image. Again, you can keep your eyes closed for this. Just that the Lord's voice is like water dripping on a sponge. Again, there's kind of, it, it impacts it and immediately soaks in and soaks through. The enemy's voice, the wolf and the hireling, the enemy's voice is like water hitting a rock. It splatters. It's kind of, it almost seems the same thing. You look at a rock and a sponge, they almost look the exact same. There's a difference. There's a qualitative difference. And I think maybe even today, where is it that you've heard the voice of the enemy, that, that's, that drop of water that hits like, like, hit like, it's like a rock, kind of scatters and spreads and affects and destroys and maybe it's like oh I was you know, thinking about this and I just all of a sudden I started thinking about what that other person said and I, what I would should have said to them or what I'm going to say to them next time and, and I can't believe this person you know they 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 they, they got a divorce and they're going to tell me about how to live my life that this kind of divisiveness and then what is it, what is the voice that hits water hitting a sponge you are loved be at peace you are mine Forgive not seven times, but 77 times. Come follow me. We see this again in this image of the baptism of Jesus. We've got that that verse up there. You can see it in Mark 1. It happened that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. On coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open, the spirit like a dove descending upon him and a voice came from the heavens you are my beloved son with you I'm well pleased you are my beloved son with you I'm well pleased again that 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 water hitting the sponge and it soaks in and and this is not something that's not like Jesus learned this at the moment of his baptism but in a sense we get a sacramental in the created world a manifestation of what's happening in God's heart so real quick this this scene the scene of the baptism you are my beloved son with you. Are my what happens right after this in all the Gospels? Who knows? What happens right after this? He goes to be tempted. He, the Spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted. Again, he who knew, knew, no, knew no sin became sin. He enters into our, our condition. And he goes into the, the wilderness, and the first word out of Satan's mouth, does anyone know what it is in tempting Jesus? If. If you are the Son of God, then What? then prove it. Prove it. So the enemy is always casting doubt on our identity. He's always attacking us there. He's always coming after us in that spot and then kind of causing us, like in someone's, you might, might experience that. You are God's beloved son. And then it's like, well, then prove it. All right, I'll show you. You know, I'll do it. And then, so we begin to perf- that performative aspect, but then also this, this lie, this doubt on the integrity of, that, of who we are. It's so good. I, I love that. I, I quoted this past weekend. We we're talking about theology of the body specifically, but St. John Paul II has this line about how original sin is an attack on fatherhood. Original sin is an attack on fatherhood, the fatherhood of God. Because once I no longer trust that God is my father who loves me, who wants to give me every good thing, in a sense, I'm, I'm out in the, in the wind. I'm trying to cobble together my own identity, my own worth. You are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. If you believe that for Jesus that is true about Jesus, then you have to say yes to that about yourself. You cannot have, you cannot believe this about Jesus unless you believe it about yourself. Because everything that he has, he's given to you. So why is the devil, it's a clever thing for, for, uh, for the devil to say like, yeah, you're God's beloved son, but 
this kind of like, but you're God's beloved son um, if, you're God's beloved son when, again, those little qualifiers, those are lies concocted in Satan's laboratory. Because as soon as we believe them, we've cut ourselves off from the shocking reality of the good news of the gospel, that God so loved the world that while we were yet sinners, God says these words over us, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Okay. So everything that ha- Jesus has is ours by grace. A couple, couple ways of, of experiencing this. And I'll just share something from my own experience. I had this great uh, opportunity years ago to do a 30-day retreat. I know. It's one of the great graces of my life to be able to have done that. 30 days, so it's a silent retreat, a directed retreat. I mean, I speak with my spiritual director once a day, and the rest of the time I'm just talking to God. That's a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff, all right? One of the reasons I think we flee silence in our society has gotten better at fleeing, running from silence in any society in the history of the world. Like, it's, I mean, think about this. When Jesus has come away by yourselves to a quiet place, like, We don't, like, if we lived in their daily lives, like their most tumultuous days, we'd be like, it is so quiet here. They they had no concept of the amount of noise that we had. So if they needed to come away to a quiet place, we really need to come come away to a quiet place, right? To take time to listen to the voice of God. Okay, so I was able to do a 30-day retreat. It was amazing. My spiritual director was fantastic, leading me through the the, the, um, the, uh, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, San Ignacio de Loyola, so good. And it's basically like a whole process of conversion. But what happens in the midst of this retreat is you do four or five hours of prayer a day. Four or five hours. And each of the prayers is usually a meditation on some aspect of the kerygma, some aspect of, uh, of God creating the world, or Jesus calling his disciples, or the woman caught in adultery, or Jesus being, you know, on the way of the cross, um, or the resurrection, or the Great Commission, all these things. You're meditating on these different scenes, and some, some scenes that Ignatius kind of meditated on about, you know, uh, how God saves us and calls us to be part of his, um, of his army to go and rescue other people. And so, at the beginning of every prayer period, what Ignatius tells people to do, he says, what I do, what I will do before I, I go to pray is I will stand, so say if I was sitting there, okay, okay, I'll stand in the place that I'm going to pray, and for the span of an Our Father, I will look upon God looking upon me. Now, this is really important because this is not just, I will look upon God. God, you're so amazing. This is so beautiful. He, he has this twist to it for the space of an Our Father, not very long, a minute, right? 37 seconds, whatever it is. You speak Spanish, 22 seconds, right? You know, that, that I'll look upon God looking upon me. Because that, that adds like kind of a wrinkle to this. So that begins to get over that tendency, or my Myra tendency, just give her all my problems and then like walk away. And imagine if I, if, I, if I gave her all my problems and never even looked at her. I'm just like, here I am, I'm struggling with this. My boss is a jerk. And I never like look at her because when you look at another person, you see their, their reactions. You see if, if Myra's like, yeah, oh my gosh. Or if she's like, uh-huh, okay. And it's like inching away. Like if you can't pick up on those, those reactions, in a sense, we're not having that depth of relationship. So to look upon God, looking upon you. So my question, and this gets back to that place of, of like hearing God speak. This is just one example of this. So I was gonna be doing this four or five times a day for 30 days. That's a lot of time. And so I was like, well, what does it look like when God looks at me? What does that look like? And here's the crazy thing, because I had a good spiritual director, because I would bring this stuff up to him, and he would say, well, ask him. Ask him. Father, what does it look like when you look at me? What, 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 am, I, what am I seeing here? And not that when I ask him that, then he begins to look at me. That it's, this is happening from all eternity. So what, 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 what occurred in that moment, so I'm like, all right, so next time I go to pray, whew, all right, I'm going to stand in the place of praying for the space of our Father. I'm going to look upon God, looking upon me. And so I just asked that question, my Father, what does it look like when you look at me? And so what came up, what came up is a memory. 
And this is one of the ways that God speaks to us, not the only way. If I can at this point be like, God only speaks to me through memories. No, that's not, no, there's lots of ways he speaks to me. He speaks to me through that still small voice, through scripture, through all sorts of things, through beauty and art and nature, and you know, just uh, movements of my heart and emotions, all sorts of ways. But in this moment, it was a memory. And the, the memory that came up was the first time that I met Benedict. And Benedict Joseph Nixon is my brother Titus's firstborn son. And so I met Benny. He's now, my goodness, he's almost, is he a teenager now? He's almost a teenager. He's going to be a teenager this upcoming year. So he's 12 years old. So I met Benny. And so uh, they were living in Jacksonville at the time. So I went and see Ty and Colleen. And I already love babies as it is. But I go, so my brother and I are best friends. I love Ty so much. He's just awesome. Colleen, his wife, is so much better. She's doing the music at the women's retreat for all the ladies here. Make sure you sign up for the women's retreat coming up at the end of this month. Um, it's, it's so good. Colleen's amazing. So I meet this brand new reality of my brother's firstborn son. And so I'm, I'm holding him, and he's, it's crazy, especially if you're close to a sibling and they have a baby. He's half my brother, which is nuts. And he's half Colleen, which is incredible. Ty really, you know, out of his league sort of thing. But he's just brand new, completely himself. And so I'm seeing him, and my heart was filled with so much love for this baby. Like, so much love. I, I, the image I always use is, you ever seen the Grinch who stole Christmas? When his, like, his heart goes to like 10 times as big or whatever? Like, boop, 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 boop. like that's, it's, 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 it's like, it like hurt. It's coming out of my chest as I look upon this baby. And my response, he's looking at me too, and like, you know, it's just, my response, I'm like crying. But my main response, I was filled with so much joy and love that I started to laugh. I was just laughing. And just, just like, just sheer delight. And so again, I had just asked God, what does it look like when you look at me? And so God brings me to this memory, to this moment, because Benny d didn't do anything to deserve that. He didn't do anything to earn that. He didn't try to impress me. He didn't try to anything. It was all just who he was. And I had just a slip because I was, the more I prayed about it, the more I was like, like, look, as I'm looking at Benny and I'm filled with more love than I've ever experienced any person in my entire life, I'm just his uncle. Like, wh like what to speak of when my brother looks at him? Like, what to speak of that? Like, it's, it, it, it's astonishing. And I, and I think about that, and again, as you just kind of, you're drawn deeper into that place. I was drawn deeper into that place. Father, what does it look like when you look at me? Like, as much as Ty loves his son, and Ty's a great father, great father, he's limited in his love. So even that just begins to pale in comparison to the, just the world-shaping, universe-creating delight of the father when he looks upon his son. Father, what does it look like when you look at me? So every time I step into this place of prayer, it's not that I'm, I'm going to make God hear me. I'm going to get him to listen to me. He's finally going to pay attention to me. He's going to look at these hurts that I'm experiencing. No, it's, it's opened myself up to the sheer and utter delight that even, even again, that, that memory, which is limited and passing and fading, that still moves my heart. That's nothing compared to the reality, the full reality of what God feels when he looks at me, which is every moment. And so to be able to answer, and again, I can't project that memory onto you. Hopefully that memory is like, oh, that's powerful. But to ask the Father that question and to allow him to respond and to see how he responds. There's something about that, about that, you know, Matthew has that, that, that line, asking you shall receive. Ask you shall receive. I love, I love this about Ignatian prayer, and Encounter Ministry does a really good job of this as well, and, and, and beginning to habituate ourselves when you go into a time of prayer, what am I asking for? What was, what was the, the older son, you know, that kind of older son, it's like, like, you've never, like, like you've never given me anything. That's, there's so much hurt in that. Maybe that's you. I've slaved my whole life for you, and you've never given me anything. Man, what a trick the devil pulls for us to live in that place but imagine if his whole life is opening himself up father this is my hope this is what i desire this is where i'm hurting this is the place that i where i'm, where I'm longing for more this is the party i want to have with my friends like there's something about that about asking boldly and god is such a good father i love this too that like not only 
Will he give you what you ask for? He loves you enough to give you something even better than what you ask for. Which that sometimes is kind of, oh, come on, God, I wanted the pony, right? So give, me, give me the pony. Give me the, give me the, the, the stuff, the thing I want. He's like, oh, I have something even better for you, which is incredible. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to do a quick thing on listening to the voice of God. And this is going to, I think this is taking us into the, uh, yeah, this will take us into the activation. Okay, so a, a little bit about the, the voice of God. We're going to go into the four basic modes of hearing God's voice. <clears throat> And there's, there's lots more we can say about this. All this kind of has scriptural, um, um, you know, uh, connections. And so first of all is seeing, seeing an image. You're closing your eyes and all of a sudden this image comes up. This image pops into your head. This image maybe you wouldn't have created for yourself. You wouldn't have thought of for yourself. It's maybe even something that's kind of like, you know, it's, it's provocative in some sort of way of like, ooh, man, I didn't think about that. I think about this sometimes when, when I, when I uh, had, had a moment, and this is on my 30 day as well, and I, I bring that up because it was, there's some, it was, all I could do was pray during that time, which is really fascinating. About a 30-day retreat, people were like, oh, is it heavenly? It's like, actually, in 30 days, I went through everything that you go through in 30 days. Anger, sadness, rage, madness, vitriol. No, it's all, you're like, man, this guy's really angry, right? No, there's like, all, all, you go through all that, but the difference is, the only place I could take it was prayer. There was nothing else to numb myself with. I didn't have my phone, I didn't have television, I didn't have the internet, I didn't have book, I didn't even have books to read, I'm a huge reader. I only had the Bible, that's the only book I had to read. So the only place I could take all this was prayer, which is awesome to begin to start, and I'm still a novice in it, begin to start to learn, to like, I'm so angry I could kill somebody. That's a great opening line for prayer. That's a great opening line for prayer. But just, just I remember this place I was, where I was, I was, just kind of just in this, this, this just feeling like, ugh, like, you know, this, this just frustration and, 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 uh, and I, I was praying over like the, the, uh, the, the trial of Jesus. That's what it was. I was praying over the trial of Jesus. And I decided to sit outside, which was a dumb idea. I was going to do my holy hour outside. You can do a holy hour outside. I don't know if you knew that. And I was like, oh, I was like, this is nice. And I sat down and I started praying. As soon as I started praying, it was like, it wasn't so nice. You know that day you're like, oh, this is really comfortable. And then like the sun kind of shifts a little bit. And it's like, I'm going to bake you. And you're just like, oh, this is, this is miserable. And that's what I'm about. I'm praying. I'm trying to sit there for a whole hour. I'm just feeling the heat, feeling kind of sweaty, not getting anything out of this prayer. And I'm just kind of like, oh. And I, I had nothing. I had, and then all of a sudden there's this, this, little, this little invitation. It's like, oh, Jesus, you felt sweaty and uncomfortable. And then all of a sudden, this sitting on a bench in a little, you know, kind of garden area at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, where I did my 30-day, this, this small little moment becomes like a little connection to what Jesus, the God-man, the creator of the universe, willingly stepped into as he's put on trial, as he's handed over to sinful men, as he's spat upon and punched in the face. Again, just to be able to experience that. It's maybe even seeing that image. I love that the scene is not always a scene like I saw something. Uh, this one, uh, this is not my experience, but someone else had an experience where they're praying with the crucifixion and they're, they're trying to like enter into it with their spiritual senses to put myself in the scene and what do I see? And what do I hear? What do I taste? What do I smell? It's a great question when you put ourselves in a scripture scene to pray with that. And this woman, she couldn't see anything. She couldn't feel anything and all that she was left with was just the sound the drip the blood of jesus dripping down off his foot off the edge of the cross onto the ground and just in darkness to hear that to experience that that all of a sudden now this woman by opening herself up to that place by just one of the senses kind of being activated there that when she thinks about the cross she, she's been there. She is there. When she receives Jesus in the Eucharist, she knows what this cost him. There's, it's not just, again, like a thought that's pious and just, it's, it's, that's brutal. That's, that's a brutal memory. And, and I think almost, it's kind of like, to think too, this taps into like, this is the memory of Mary and, John, and, and St. John. This is what all the saints who loved Jesus crucified, St. Paul he says, I bear the marks of the, of, uh, of the wounds of Jesus in my very body. What does that mean? Did he have the stigmata? I'm not sure. 
But he says, I want to know nothing else except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It starts to give us a window of how we live our lives that way, when we've heard him in that profound way. I love this, so the, the Vox Mentis, and then I'm going to hand it over to, um, to Nick here. This, <clears throat> this voice of the mind, this voice of the mind of being able to hear, so I quiet myself, I quiet myself, and then I hear just a line, just a phrase, just a word. And to be able to receive that, to weigh it out, obviously we discern if it's something that's against what God has revealed, and we get science, but, but generally we can tell it's water on the, in, on the sponge. My beloved, my son, my daughter, my apostle, my disciple, my prophet, you are mine. To be able to hear that and to rejoice with it. Okay. There's lots more we could say about all this, but I'm going to hand this over. Oh, can we just do Luke 11 real quick? I'm going to do Luke 11. I'm, I'm going to hand this over to, uh, to Dr. Nick. If you got your Bible, I'm going to turn to Luke 11. There's this one line that's just, this whole, this whole part is so great. If you got Luke 11, it's, it's, on, the, it's on there. Oh, yeah. Luke 11, 11. Luke 11, 11, Jesus says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So this reality that God is a good father and wants to speak to us, wants to give us the very best of gifts. I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Nick, and uh, he's, going to take, he's going to take us into the activation. So your prayer posture is going to be a space where you're comfortable. We, we want to honor the temple of the Spirit, right? That's you. So get comfortable. Not so comfortable that you fall asleep. And what we're doing here is whatever truth has been taught, any night that we're, we're here in Encounter, or whatever truth has been taught, an activation is an opportunity for the rubber of that truth to meet the road of our life. So we're asking the Holy Spirit to activate the truth that the Father desires to speak to us, that there's, there's no distinction in the Father's eyes between Jesus and all that he has by his nature, we have by grace. We have been invited to participate in that relationship of the Father and the Son, and that he loves to speak to us. That he speaks to us sometimes in seeing an image, in hearing a thought in that vox mentis by a feeling or a knowing that comes upon us, that he loves to speak to us. So find that comfortable posture, and we're going to try and activate that, that supernatural reality, that supernatural identity that he has placed in us through our baptism to receive the fullness of that gift. Revelations 3 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will enter his house and dine with him, and he with me. So I'd invite you now to just hear, hear with your spiritual ears, hear the sound of Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. What does that sound like? How is, he, how is he knocking on the door of your heart? And as you hear him knocking on the door of your heart, how will you let him enter? How will you invite him in?
And as you invite him in, and he invites you into the relationship that he has with the Father. So I'd invite you to pray with me. Pray these declarations, these truths. So repeat with me, I believe and declare that Jesus is the good shepherd and I am his sheep. I hear his voice because of who I am. I believe and declare that from my baptism, I have an open heaven over me. I have access to the Father. I believe and declare that when I ask God questions, He loves to answer me. So as we've declared this truth, the intimacy that we have with the Father through Christ Jesus, I'd invite you to ask the Father. Father, do you want to speak to me? Again, the answer is always yes. He delights in speaking to his children. Now ask him, Father, do you love me? Now again, one last question, and we're going to talk about this more and more throughout this quarter on identity and transformation. It's important to use our voice to speak out loud, to expect the Father to respond. So I'd invite you to repeat this question with me. Father, what do you think of me right now? Father, what do you think of me right now? Father God, we thank you 
for what you've spoken to us here tonight. We thank you for the way that you've called us to a deeper understanding of our baptism, of the graces that you've already poured out upon us, just the profound depth of intimacy that you desire with us. We thank you that you challenge these false beliefs that we very often operate in, that our culture operates in, that they don't want to speak to us or, or we're not special enough or only when we do the right things. Father, we thank you for your gratuitous love as we pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. When we're in activation like that, I always want to just wait. I just want to rest. Uh, but I also want to be sensitive to what's going on in other people. You know, like, uh, again, I loved the word that Father Michael had. Uh, maybe it's better for us to say, you know, I'm still learning how to hear the voice of the Father. You know, that's okay. Uh, it's okay if you're like, whoa, this is a, this is a great, uh, great teaching, great exhortation. But man, it's still rough for me. That sounds like I was just sitting in silence. But is there anybody that had uh, something, an experience that they'd like to share? Anybody that, that heard something that touched their heart or moved them? If you're like sort of nervous, that's a, a good sign. If you're like, uh, oh, I don't know if I really want to share that, 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 that you'd be the one. Um, I see some of you looking at me and smiling and not, not wanting me to look at you. But I won't press anybody. This is Myra, by the way. This is weird. <laughs> okay, no. Um, so, like, I have like my I, I have a teenager niece with me, and so like it's always like me making sure like I'm that perfect perspective for her because she like looks up to me. But like I don't like whenever we were doing that, it kind of just it like gotten like a, I got like an image of like it was Jesus sitting with me like on a log and I was a kid like I wasn't the adult in that moment I was the kid with him and like he was just listening to me like pour like all my problems I, it was like that and it just felt like really warm and fuzzy and like it just made me like tear up and it was yeah so yeah. it's hard if we feel like we have to be the adult all the time right like, if, if we think we're the only adult or we're in all those relationships where we have to be adulting, uh, but we are all actually children in the kingdom of heaven, right? We, we are all learning and figuring this out, and he delights in being the father and the adult for us, and he delights when we would just, like, rattle off and be like, oh my gosh, like, I have a nine-year-old that will just ramble. She's, she's so beautiful. She'll share her whole day, and I'll just sit, and I'll, like, Sometimes I'll ask a question because I don't actually understand what Wait, hang on, a, I missed it. And she, she delights in her father delighting in her. Oh, man, that's such a, that, that's teaching me how to pray. Just spending time with my nine-year-old. Anybody else? So, oh, I don't think I've ever used one of these. Uh -huh. So I, um, if Father Michael has been, amazing and helping me understand how God views me. He, he used a great example of Ryan Rogers and his uh, baby. And um, that really hit home for me. I always saw myself as a uh, uh, like servant to master relationship with God and it, that, that lie the devil sows. So his story of um, how God views him and him and his little nephew uh, so what was revealed to me was the combination of what I saw when he did that with Ryan Rogers, his story today, and the prodigal son where he's coming back and showing that immense amount of love, but as an infant mm -hmm. and just in, enjoying even our greatest of flaws. That's how I understood it. He enjoys even my incapacity, right? Like, he's, he's excited that I'm going to learn how to walk one day, but there I fall flat on my butt again, and he's like, oh, it's okay. You get up and try again. You got it. It's so good. So good. He's, he's excited that I take a tottering step. So I think a lot of us are beginning to take tottering steps, and that's great. Like, this is a good place to take tottering steps. We call it a school. And so if you're, you're starting to teeter and totter, awesome. 
If you're like running along, awesome. This is a school where this is a, a, a great place to fall flat on our face um, and to keep pressing in for more, to keep pressing in for more intimacy. Um, I love what Father Michael said earlier tonight. He said, these activations are things that we can do anywhere. Like we end every night, every teaching with an activation and it's great. Take some notes. Like if you find an activation where you're just like, oh, that really struck my heart. Father, how do you see me now? Like I, I think every one of us, there's a particular image that the Father would like to give you to tell you about how he sees you, how he looks at you with love. And it's gonna be like these images, like Ryan holding Damien. And, and, and Father Michael, when he first experienced Benny, when he saw the, the beautiful mix of Colleen, his sister-in-law, and Ty, his best friend, his brother, and it saw in this new human being, oh my gosh, and the way his heart swelled. There's a place that the Father wants to give you an image of his particular love for you. Um, really press into that. I'd encourage you to press into that. I'm convicted that I, I actually want to press in. Father, how, how is it that you see me? Um, you also have homework. So your homework, your journaling homework, is in prayer, identify a specific question or decision in your life that is important to you. In a very direct manner, ask Jesus what his heart is about that decision or question. Are you telling me that I can put it up here? I can. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. In a very direct manner, ask Jesus what his heart is about the decision or question. Using a notebook or journal, record your responses to the following questions. What did you ask? What did you receive from the Lord? How did you receive it? And what did you learn about how you hear God's voice? And bonus points on this. Uh, again, we talked about four principal ways that God delights in speaking to us through us. He speaks to us sometimes through seeing, like seeing with, with supernatural eyes where we have an image, a vision in our mind's eye. Um, sometimes through knowing, it just comes upon us like, oh, he's giving me his perspective. Sometimes through feeling, like emotion of my own heart where I feel uh, a, a different way about a circumstance than I would have understood myself to before. Uh, seeing, thinking, feeling, hearing. Hearing his voice, sometimes that box mentis. Like where uh, we all have a, a vox mentis, a voice of our mind, uh, where, for example, my name is Nicholas Ross Wagner, and I can say my first, middle, and last name here in my vox mentis right now. Do it with me. Say your first, middle, and last name. Here we go. Did you hear that? That's your vox mentis. So very often the Lord will speak to you in that place. That, that uh, Fadze Ufsefe used to say, from the side, this crazy Sudanese priest from the side when something comes in. So what did you receive from the Lord? Like bonus points, if you can identify where it was in those principal four modes that we were talking about receiving from the Lord. Um, what did you learn about how you hear God's voice? And then also your supplemental reading is the Spiritual Gifts Handbook, chapter two. And we will be back here next week, same time, same place. Dinner's at five. We figured out tonight, it's actually five in the, uh, in the church office. Uh, that's the most intimate and great kitchen for us instead of uh, over here where we have to compete with other events. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Let's just close with a prayer. Um, and actually, I'd invite you to stand and let's just uh, let, let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Uh, just thanking him for tonight. Uh, thanking him for the way that he desires to be a father to us and to call us into that relationship with him as his sons and daughters. As we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth.